cranial nerves, you guys are all experts on cranial nerves, right? Right. <coughs> Name the four parasympathetic cranial nerves. No, no second, off the top of your head, let's go. You had all week to get them down. No, not five. Three, seven, nine, ten. What are they? Ocular motor, facial, oculopharyngeal, vagus. Turn it over just like that, people. Let's go. All right? So why would you think five? Because five is a kind of a weird nerve, trigeminal, with three branches. It does a lot of things, but it doesn't have parasympathetic. It covers muscles of mastication. Parasympathetic, right? Parasympathetic means you don't control it. How about the sympathetic nerves? You don't, have you don't control that either. There are no sympathetic nerves in the cranial system. Um, they use stellar ganglion up here and follow their own way in with them to get there. Um, okay, we're going to cover that when we go into the autonomic system today. Hopefully. Last night's like a two hour flight. Should have taken like an hour and a half. The whole lecture was done in an hour. I said, well, it's a gift. Goodbye. It's a nice night. See you Thursday. I didn't mind. Monday night class went like two, two and over two hours for some reason. But doesn't make any sense. Yeah, too many questions. Okay. Brachial plexus C5T1. You're experts on that. So you're experts on cranial nerves. You better be. I like to ask a lot of questions on them. This and Cranial nerves play a big role on your test. I love asking brachial plexus questions and brachial nerve and the uh, cranial nerve. But yeah, he's new. He's, he's a new student. He just signed up. Thank you. I thought I was going crazy with this guy. Oh, he's new. He's never met you. <laughs> She's never met you before. <laughs> So again, with cranial nerves, you better have them down. Okay, let's talk about what is the pupillary reflex, what two nerves? Before we go into this, make sure we know our cranial nerves. And optic, optic is the sensory component, ocular is the motor component, right? Uh -huh. So let's talk about, we get a person that's blind in their left eye, and I shine your pen light in the right eye. Will I get a reaction out of the left eye? No. Yes. yes. And it's not the accommodation reflex. You should do like you are right, but they had two and false questions. If you answer false, you have to tell me you have to explain why it was false and give what the true answer would be. We didn't kind of have seven sections, you can do stuff like that. Right? Like three or four sections, you can make a lot more writing on the exam. So even if the right part of the nerve is just jogging, she did something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? If the right nerve is transected, will the left people still react? Why? Not actually. You want to think. The motor component is not touching. That's right. That's right. <laughs> right. The motor component is still there coming out of the ocular motor. That's the reason why. So if I cut a sagittal cut on your chiasma, what type of vision disturbance will I see? Central vision. I do a sagittal cut of the chiasma. Where do I lose my visual fields? <coughs> the medial vision? I use medial in both eyes. You were right first time. Oh, it's kind of difficult to pick up a little bit. Oh, a beer. Oh, beer. Well, that's, you're right to camp. <laughs> okay, so here we go. So we have, so everybody agrees with that. We want to lose medial vision in both eyes, correct? So if I cut the left optic track, what would I see? Nothing in the right eye. And exactly. Good job. Now, if we cut the right optic nerve, you're blind in your left eye. Right eye. Right because right you said the eye. You said the right optic nerve. Oh, you said left eye. I'm just going to say it's All right, make sure you know that. You're definitely going to get this. That's def those things.
things that definitely asked on the test. Pupil of reflex, cutting this track. So you got like five questions there that, that we covered it so heavy in here, you want. There's no reason to miss it. If you miss it, you deserve the lousy grade. Simple. Just don't put your true false off the test. Why did you fall off the test? Oh, no, we need, we need to fall. Well, the fall of the is not challenged. Okay. So we know we're back to this guy now. So just get it down. Know which one's a parasympathetic. Which one's going to be sensory? Which one's going to be motor? After that, we had to give it three sensory nerves only from the, from the cranial. The optic nerve, the olfactory nerve, and the vestibular uh, But you're going to know them like that. You have a week to do it. They gave you nothing else to do with the rest of the week. Very disappointed with you guys. Why are you drinking beer? You should have been Okay. Back to this. So, in the cat, you were down to this point. You saw the gap. In the model, you were here. And we got into the chords. The reason this thing is set up this way, you're taking something that runs superior to inferior and turning it anterior to posterior. So it's gonna, it's gonna like torsion itself. And how it does it, you take the superior, middle, and inferior trunks, and we have to twist them into the anterior posterior division, which now make chords. So the, the medial and lateral cord will take care of the whole front of the upper extremity. Posterior cord takes care of the whole back of the upper extremity. So you've shifted it now that it can do that. And we know the anterior, the anterior part, which is coming from the medial lateral cord, is primarily going to make up our muscular cutaneous side median and our ulna, which makes the M. And the posterior cord is going to give me radial and axillary. So at least understand that. Okay, you do get one, there's two, two pictures. One picture is showing you the lesions so you can figure out the questions. But another picture will be on a, <clears throat> a cross section of the spine and leg on you. You know, so you do have a picture like that. I was going to use this as a picture and blank all this out and forget it. You guys will be here for all day, so forget it. That's not happening. I'll play like being all day with the day of the test. Hello. <sighs> okay, so. Now, so we don't see 5, 6, 7, 8, T1 on my roots. So what we're going to focus on really with this place is the root and the nerve. That's what you're going to be responsible for. You okay, understand what you're testing for. So knowing that, let's get down. And this is giving you a nice schematic of it. It shows you what it really looks like if you look at the data. That's a real great bisection. And we're going to go into the first group of nerves. So, the only the highlight is red and the muscles you're responsible for. You can see there's a crap load of muscles that I'm not making you responsible for. All right? It's kind of the muscles that kind of mess your brain up a bit that you make you responsible for. And it's so you think. And let's take it for instance here. So, we're always talking about muscular cutaneous with my bicep, correct? There we go. Medium in my thumb, all in my pinky, radio in the back of my hand, and um, all the way up to my shoulder. And the shoulder region is the axillary. So that's a given. We know that. Okay. So it's going to kind of feed that way to muscles. You know, that's how it's going to feed itself. All right. So we get the muscle cutaneous nerve, which is C5, 6, 7. So C5 to 7 makes up that, that nerve. They unite together. It makes muscle cutaneous, and it's going to innervate the three muscles that are in, the, in your anterior brachial region, such as vertical brachialis, biceps brachialis, brachialis. So if someone came to you someday when you're a nurse or wherever you are, <laughs> and you're a doctor, and they, they're very weak at flexing their right arm, there's no muscle wasting in the forearm, but there's a lot of weakness of this region here, you start thinking in your mind, the lesion has to be somewhere in that five, six, seven area affecting only the muscle continuous nerve. And then we EMG it to show it. And then you know you have damage there. Why? We don't know yet why it's happening. 
You know, if it can be duplicated, then it's usually orthopedic related or neuromuscular related. If you can't duplicate it, then it might be visceral related, something much more serious. And then you go into the visceral. And that's how you rule out, is it, you know, say, why do we get shoulder pain? We'll get into this in lab, but we'll talk about it right now. When somebody's got gallbladder disease. Well, in lab, you're going to learn we have the phrenic nerves, right and left phrenics. The phrenics innervate the diaphragm. And their spinal nerves that are working autonomically, spinal nerve, imagine that works on an autonomic system that you don't really control, coming out of C345. And how you never forget that? Because C345 will keep my diaphragm alive. Five alive, five alive. So when you're looking at the schematics, you know, when you're taking the test, well, two, three, four doesn't rhyme, right? Four, five, six don't rhyme, but three, four, five rhymes, so that's going to be frantic. That goes with it. That's how you keep it in your head. Five alive. You know, when I taught this to high school kids, even the bottom of the class kid that didn't give two craps about the course didn't get that wrong on the test because they could be doing a mnemonic in their head. We get to college and we just have trouble with that. Well, we drink more beer at this level, I guess. <laughs> they do more of the magic weed, we do more beer. But, so here we go. So, so if you think about what you would see when you damage it, then you don't have to memorize it, because you know it. So you're going to see the difference between phys and anatomy. And that is like 75% memory, 25% applying it. But physiology is probably 40% memory. 60% applying it. So if you're a good person at applying concepts, you're going to find physiology much easier than that. You know, most people do. Most people I talk to find phys easier than this. Because this is like a stinking final line where you're learning all these terms. But the more you can apply them, the less memory it becomes to make it more clinical functional anatomy, which is going to help you as a nurse, as a doctor, physical therapist, you know, x-ray tech. And it compared to being a biology major. The biology major needs all the nonsense, little terms that nobody ever to worry about in life. So that breaks it down easy. Now we get into a little more complicated. We go to the median. Well, this median's a big nerve covering a lot of territory. So if you look, it's using the whole plexus. It's using C5 to T1 for its movements. And there's only two major muscles I'm making the one, even though it's doing mostly a thin our region. You know, and it's going to do the flexor compi radialis and flexor digitorum profundus, one half of the flexor digitorum profundus. And where is your flexor digitorum profundus? Follow up your arm, or up your tendons till you finally get to the meaty part of the arm. Start wiggling your fingers in, and you feel the muscle contracting under your fingers. That's your flexor digitorum profundus. A lot of people don't have the palmaris longus. Like 25% of the palmaris don't have this, so that's why they don't bother with it. But this flex the carpal by radialis is important because it's going to flex the carpals. And when you put your hand down here on the tendons and flex your carpals in, you feel the tendon come off laterally, and guess where you are? You're right on the radial pulse. So you don't screw up and you know what you're doing when you're a nurse and they take a pulse. Yes, I know, I'm mean, into electronics today. I mean, you go somewhere and they get this thing, with, boom, there's the temperature, put this thing on your finger, it's giving oxygen levels, it's giving pulse rate, put it to cuff all right, it takes your blood pressure. It's like you can have a robot do it. But what happens if it breaks? Or you're in, on the street and this happens to a person? Do you know how to take a pulse for real? Do you know how to take respiration rate for real? Yes. Do you know how to do it at the same time when the person don't realize you're watching their chest so they don't start holding their breath? So you fake the patient out. You know, when I said to teach uh, clinical correlations here with the end of the uh, medical systems take, you teach them how to do physical exam, you teach them how to do blood pressure, the vitals, and you show them how to do the vitals, and the first thing you would do is you take the thermometer, stick it in their mouth so they can't talk to you. So you shut the patient up for the next five minutes. The rectal thermometer. The rectal thermometer. Yes. Because the finger won't fall off. <laughs> it's like we have an endoscopy, endoscope and a colonoscopy on the same day. I better have a funny taste in my mouth when I'm done. I better do it in the morning. We're doing that sometime in May. So, this is one half. So, it's kind of like a protective mechanism. Even if this nerve gets 
damaged, you still would have some control of your hand because the southern nerve can still take control of this muscle. But just remember, flexing compound radialis. So if is the medium. Most people are going to get this wrong on a true and false question or on a why? Because as soon as they see this term radialis, they're going to go jump boom to radial nerve. They're not paying attention to the flexor. So that's why I focus on these couple of muscles, because people mess them all up all the time. 30% will get it wrong. Because you don't listen. And all you want to know is the one in red. This is the other one in red. Then we go to ulnar nerve. Well, ulnar nerve is going to control the pinky area. All right? So if you look at a hand, that's the anterior portion of a hand, look at what it's controlling. Medians, thumb, index, middle, half the ring finger. Then when you look at the elbow, the elbow is doing the other half of the ring finger in the pinky. So it's weird, you split up this finger. That's right, it's weird to control this finger compared to the others because you have two nerves fire at it at the same time. That's why when you try to do things with it, what the heck, if I grab it, push it there, then it works better. Because you got two nerves and they said, well, that's because you're bulky. Let's <laughs> Don't tell Live long in public school. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, but the point is, it's, it's a weirder finger to control than the others. The middle finger is the easiest one. It sticks right up, right? Yeah. So that's the reason why the way we branch across it. Okay? And so with this nerve here, you're going to see it's going to control the other half of that flexor digitorum fundus in flexor combinal nerves. When you look at them, who does the majority of the forearm muscles? Medium. The medium. So when you're in doubt with a forearm muscle, in, not for this course, but in the future, go with medium. FDP is all. And when you're in doubt with the thick, deep muscles of the hand, go with only. Because it does a lot of the, it does a lot of the lumbricals in the thoracic seven. So, you know, the other does a lot of your ability to do this stuff. Okay, the median more of the thumb and this finger does a lot. Okay? So, but look at the flexor compound. Well, it makes sense here because it's the own the own nerve. So I don't screw that one up. Right? Kind of makes sense to you. But you're not paying attention to the word in the front, flexor. Flexor side of the body. Because when we have flexor muscles like that. We're going to have extensor muscles with the same name. And you'll see in the next picture. Here we go. Now we're going to go to the radial. Let's do axillary first. Get it out of the way because it's easy. C5-6. So what happens to your phrenic nerve when you're picking up gallbladder pain? It, it does not have a sensory component to feed back. And then it spills over to the axillary nerve to keep it short of the It's called nerve spill. So the nervous system is very weird, very complicated. Simple in some ways, complicated in others to figure out what's wrong with it. Dead center T9, T10 pain. No trauma induced, nothing, x, every, x rays are normal. You're going to start thinking pancreatic disease. Just look like it's going out of style. I had a patient, I don't know what ever happened to when I stopped practicing and referred to somewhere else, but they keep saying, well, they can't fight nothing. I think somewhere in her is a pancreatic tumor and they're not seeing it because I got, they got, I got an ambulance on her that was through the roof. Which is common when the gallbladder was functioning fine, so it's not a gallbladder, it's got to be the pancreas. If I have ambulance through the roof, and, and mid dorsal pain, it's showing me the picture of, of a pancreas. And the GI no, no, she dies of pancreatic cancer, and I guess I was right. Which does happen in some cases. You know you're right, and you keep sending them, and you don't get an oncologist to agree with you, or someone else to agree with you, patients are dying. But look at this guy. This innervates two muscles. Deltoids easy, and the teres minor. Minor. The maze does its own thing. I'm going to tell you, we can interface the maze in a second, but it's not up here. But that's the minor. I want you to do the fast. We'll come talk over here, not to some of you people. This is like the neglected side of the room. There's no love for the 
when the nail went through the copper bones, it crushes right through the median nerve and settles it. So that's going to feel wonderful. You know, it's the most humiliating way to be put to death in that time frame. Discovered in 300 BC, another way of killing people to make them so. So that was the way they made a point. You know, today they do different things to make a point. You protest them, but then we're making a point to show that the protest was crucified. So you're going to think twice when the next person goes, "Oh, that's not me. I want to know about this." You know, and they died because of asphyxiation. Is why a person dies. Asphyxiation meant when you get shot, you kill someone that's crucified. It has nothing to do with nails in your hands and feet. You're in a position that all the burden goes on the chest cavity and it can't breathe. Die. Yeah, so, but that's going to feel wonderful driving nails through your hand. You know, right through the bones and it's stuck in the bones and everything. So that's why, but I've got to use the term eight hand. The reason is you can't oppose your thumb anymore. You lose opposition to the thumb. That's why your grip gets weak. So eight hands are better terminology for the condition. And it doesn't happen in the cubicle fossil. That's very rare to see that. Very, I don't know why you push the elbow region. This book is like, I don't know, it must have been high when they were writing it. But the point is, it's, it's a carpal tunnel problem. So, carpal tunnel syndrome is the median nerve. Next, we go to his ulnar nerve, claw hand. Ulnar nerve is claw hand. And what it is, you're losing function of your, of your ring finger and your pinky. Yeah, you like that. David's got claw hand. So, in the person's fingers, you get stuck in this plane where they couldn't move these two anymore. They can't, they can't get them to, you know, they only can extend out, but they stay locked in this flex position. Why? In the most common area where this nerve will get hung up, well, there's two areas. The most common is the medial upper condyle. That's your funny bone, right? That's when you smash. When you smash your funny bone, you smash right on the ulnar nerve. And if you tap on it, you can actually feel go down into your fingers. So there you go. So a lot of times they go in and they translocate them. They take it and move it. If it's really hung up. So a bad fracture of the neural condyle, a dislocation of the elbow, these things can damage this nerve. But also you can also crush it here in the hand too. A couple of big tunnels of geodes. One's right here, yeah, the book of the hands. There's a tunnel called Tunnel of Jim. And you, by pushing on it, or you fall on it, you can crush that tunnel and damage the nerve. Okay, so that's claw hand, goes with armor. Last but not least, wrist drop. Person walking up. So you're talking to somebody, yeah, the wrist, the person's going to come and put his hand. It's not that, it's not that he's happy to see you. No. So, <coughs> The, what will happen? You can't extend the wrist anymore. You lose wrist extension because of radial nerve damage, which makes sense. It'll be weakness. Hmm. What causes this? Radial nerve damage. <coughs> yes. So you lose extensions. Especially in these smaller muscles. The bigger muscles take longer to waste. They do waste, but Small muscles, look, every day a muscle's tied up that can't be used. It takes three to four days to rehab. So if you cast something for six weeks, you're looking at 18 weeks to bring it back to normal strength. That's your rule of thumb that you use to figure out treatment. So the more it's braced and can't move, <coughs> You get muscle, pseudex atrophy, muscle waste. For every day a muscle is immobilized, it takes three days to rehab it. That's how fast it dies. It's tissue that has to be used. So there's a lot of things you do by cross nerve using your right hand to squeeze a ball if this hand's totally braced. By firing these fibers, these fibers also fire in your brain to keep them somewhat alive, so it does help. So they're doing a lot more stuff like that today in rehabilitation than they did years ago. I mean, they don't really, you know, the, the point of no pain, no gain is out the window. I went out 20 years ago. 
rehab so we don't push them to the point of death. No. Because you will, you're doing more harm than good. What's pain symptoms telling the body? You're damaging it. Stop doing it. You know, so. So athletes who push beyond that pain thing all the time, they're not going to last as long in a sport as someone who stops at that point. Because pain means damage. Yeah, so you want to have the best record, but you know what? Yeah, you did the best record, but in five years, your history, you're gone. Instead of having a long, healthy, you know, pro sport, whatever you're doing. All right, so, Mr. The, the one that's not here would, would be brachial plexus palsy. And what that would be is that a person's arm would be stuck, maybe a baby, a newborn would be stuck in this position, head to the tip to fall. Because why you go to a restaurant, you can't sit down and take 20 bucks and stick it. Puts it in his pocket quick so nobody sees it. So, <laughs> so the arm is stuck in this plane. <clears throat> the most common cause of that, of course, that's the river, were very common. As they drag the baby out, the shoulder gets hung up on the pelvis and they yank to get the baby out, and it tears out the brachial plexus. Now, if you just contuse it, it will come back. If it's torn, no, the baby will stay paralyzed like this far on the side. So, you know, so that's when you see these different boys and things that practice. There you go. So, these three that we went over are the ones you'd be responsible for. Instead of calling the, um, the Dominion hand or go to eight hand, because that's what I'm going to use when you study that in the test, is eight hand, okay? So now from there, where do we go? And so we're going to go here. So you have the operated femoral nerve, and see this one here? Yeah, that's not red before we get into this. What do you do if you get a young female who comes in and she says, I have numbness on the side. <laughs> I can't even look at it right now. On the sides, on each, the outsides of my thighs. It goes like from here, this is weird, like pins and needles feel. Like hands and shoulders. Partial back pressure. Partial back pressure. It says partial back mm -hmm. over extension of legs. Is that sign of No. It sounds like someone was wearing their pants too tight. Huh, really? And what's happening is the pants are literally compressing the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve against the pelvic bone and starts aggravating. And you'll see that it's called paralysis mineralgia. This is probably what you put as your diagnostic term. But it's, it's that nerve that gets involved, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. Because when the hip huggers are big, the hip hugger jeans, and you wear them, they're nice and tight fitted on them, they're compressing against the, that nerve, and they cause this discomfort. So that's what it is. It's not that they get an MS, they don't have a tumor in their back. You just look at the wear. Say, do you like to wear a lot of tight clothes like you have on now? Yeah, that's 90% of your problem. That move was nice. Is that practice? Yes, I practice it every day. <laughs> I'll well, take the wrong I'll <laughs> take the wrong thing. So that happened. Just like when I was in school studying to be a doctor, the big platform, high heel shoes were in, the platform shoes. In the mid 70s, they had the disco looks. Did you wear those? And not only broke it, yeah, I should have to wear those when I was on the disco floor. But, <laughs> but the, the, not just the broken ankle, they had a lot of menstrual problems. Why do you think? A lot of menstrual problems. Why do you think? Because they were doing a lot of drugs. How old is that point? No, I was born. I think they were doing drugs today. You could be more sophisticated drugs today than back then. Oh. Well, think about it. What are they doing today? How is it? Washing. Which is doing what? Just in the universe, everything is washing. So uh, structure and function structure plays a big role on function. So just by a bad gait, by wearing bad shoes, can affect things going on in your viscera. And there's a big study done on that. And that's why the shoe got knocked out eventually. But I remember reading a journal article on it when I was in school, like in my third or fourth semester of 
chiropractic school when they read the journal on this thing that showed girls in mini skirts. It, then it actually focused on this, watching what the spine was doing and causing a lot of problems. Because when you're in your PMS phase and bloaty, don't you have a lot of low back discomfort at the same time? Yeah. The nerve endings are all swollen that are going in to feed all those organs. So believe it or not, when you manipulate the lower back on these females, you get to you know, see more than a week before the period, tell them, cut down your salt intake, increase your water intake, and just those few things, and manipulate the spine, they feel a little better. But that's what you want to do, is You like take the salt. edema out of it. <laughs> yeah, but you do, you create the salt, but you don't, you really shouldn't be sticking that in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Even though they would like to stick salt in the bottom. And this is showing you the big schematic of the common tibia, which is sciatic. The sciatic nerve is going to create the common fibula and the tibia, which we know. So let's break down and look at them in their sense of where they're going. So we do femoral and optimator first. One other one that doesn't gain such, if I have it or not, is. In other words, the null exists is the gluteal nerve, which is also L2 to L4 root innervation. And what do you think it innervates? The glutes. The glutes. The three glutes and the TFL, tensor fascia lata. So your glutes and the TFL. Just put that there. I don't know if it's on the test or not. Just in case it is, uh, you give it. Let's give it to you. So you can't say you never, never gave it. There it is. Okay. <laughs> well, you never know, David. It could be us. Okay. Femoral nerve. Well, the femoral nerve is going to take care of what? How did you see the femoral nerve in the cat? What muscle did we move to see it? No. No. Well, yes, let's go. Yeah. 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 But I wanted to hear her and she was picking up on what she was saying when she was. She went through everything else. She went all around the whole leg, but we finally got to the front. Okay, we're here, right? So we took that, we reflected it, and there you had the femoral triad when theory has the femoral nerve, artery, and vein. So femoral nerve is going to feed what? The anterior compartment. You know it's in the anterior compartment, sartorius and the quads, right? Where is the quads? What are the four muscles that make the quadriceps? Sartorius, right? Oh, that's right? The femoris and the three vastus. Mm -hmm. Vastus medialis and the medius lateralis. So I told you the muscles would be back on this test one more time. I didn't like them. The uh, pectineus adductor brevis that we did not learn on the muscle practical. Is that going to be on That's going to relax, 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 relax. We'll call it the effect of hormones. But we're not there. We're not in the We're over here, okay? All right? Victinius shares too, but we're going to keep it more without the radiant, keep it away from the femoral. Okay, so the femoral is taking care of my anterior compartment. So if someone had weakness to extend their knee, you're thinking of femoral nerve lesion, no? There's no pain, there's weakness. You think femoral nerve lesion. Yeah, so I, I always wanted to go to one step farther and think, what would happen? So I'll two, I'll four. Now we go into the medial compartment, which is what? The optimator. Right. Now how do we see the optimator, my friend, right there? We take what muscle and pull it back? Bacillus. You were a teenage boy, you, you wish your girlfriend's optimators didn't work, but they did, so you were out of luck. So, all right, so that's going to innovate Priscilla's, Pectinius, and the adductor femoris. Just leave it at that, adductor femoris. Because we're going to put all three adductors in there for David. Just call it adductor femoris. But we'll add Pectinius. All right, so the ability to bring the leg in, the medial palm. So if you go weakness on the Priscilla's or something, maybe there's nerve damage to the optimator. She damaged it during childbirth, who knows? Mm -hmm. 
So just think of where they are in what they're doing. Okay? You know the empowerment's already, you know the muscle's there, you know the action, now you're putting the, the electricity to it to make it work. That's all you're doing right now. So the only new thing is the operator, not even new because you know it existed because you saw it in the cats and on the model. Now we're just adding it in here to tell you what it's doing. So this isn't new. Trader of nerves are new, but this is not new. This is old stuff. Dude. It's a piece of cake. Now we go to the back. So sciatic, in theory, takes care of the posterior thigh. What muscles would be, so at this point we're still sciatic. So what muscles did we, did we learn that are in the back? Well, the hamstrings, which consists of biceps from Morris, semi-tendinosis, semi-membranosis, right? So if the person has discomfort in flexing the knee or weakness, they probably have a sciatic nerve problem. What's your most common problem in the low back, a sciatic nerve. Why? Because it's a big nerve. Look at its innervation. It goes really L4 to S3. The whole rest of that plexus is taking care of the sciatic nerve. S4 and, and the coccyx take care of all the perineal area. But this is going down. Okay. So this is going all the way down to your toes, your feet, everything is in the sciatic nerve. Sciatic nerve eventually will give me two branches, right? It's going to give me, if I go straight posterior, it's going to branch into the tibial, which is going to give me the gastroxenemius and soleus. This is all this, but just those two you learn. All right, so if the person has a problem with that, they won't be able to do what? Stand on their toes. So you tell them, walking on your toes. They'll be like, they can't do it. So they have weakness. So now you know you're way down in the, you're way down in the, in the area of the spine, you're not up high. Not at L4-5, we're probably more down as, you know, the S1, those are my problems. Then we go into the, the anterior lateral leg, and what's feeding that? Common fibula. And that's going to take care of two muscles we learned, the tibialis anterior, extensive to the tongue longest. So if somebody had damaged that nerve, you'd hear them walking like this. That's how they would walk. They're not tap dancers, no. They just, you know, so there's weakness of this compartment. Why? Because there's probably nerve damage. Why? Maybe they got an S1, S2 disc. Who knows? So you evaluate and figure it out. So now what you've done, you've taken kind of what you've learned, and we've put it all together now into these experiments. To make it make more sense to you. Why the sciatic and the person's all like, now you understand why. Look what it's covered. One way to test the S1 is check the big toe. Basically, it does say, hold your big toe back, you want to push it down. You can't move right down the toes, your weakness. Because it's weird when we play, you're only getting L4, S1, L5 is tough. <clears throat> so, there you go. Another expert on this. Right? You better be. You better be. And the anatomy's major is innervated by subscapular nerve for those who are interested. So the anatomy's major would be innervated by the same nerve that's innervated in subscapularis, subscapular. So just for FYI. It's innervated by what? What? The same so, same what's the muscle? Subscapularis, subscapular nerve, also innervated in the anatomy's major. Not the minor, the major, okay? So that takes care of the all the nerve, spinal nerve stuff. So now what we're going to go into is the autonomic nervous system. And then we'll be done with nervous system today. So we're going to use a lot of blackboard too with this. So we get a pretty color right up like this. So what we're going to do first, so we're going to go over the final nerve chapter.
we'll go back to this big block that we looked at this evening. So they put a block there. Just on the motor side only. The motor only, nothing else. Okay? So, first thing we're going to compare somatic to over now. So, right off the top of your head, you know that this one is voluntary, and this one is involuntary. the bell goes off in your head. Mainly this one's going to feed skeletal muscle. And this one's going to feed smooth cardiac and glands. That's why it's autonomic function. You don't worry about your glands secreting, you just do it on your own. So that's two big things. But a key point is this when we look at it. One has two ganglions and one has one. The somatic system is the top nerve, which is only a one ganglion system. So it's only a one ganglion system. One ganglion. And where is it? It's in the central nervous system. That's your motor ganglion, right? Your motor neuron. So you're kind of seeing your motor neuron. And it only runs on one type of neurotransmitter. Which is what? Acetylcholine. Acetylcholine. ACH. Acetylcholine. So that's, that's a given. The other system is a little more complicated because it has pre and post synaptic ganglions. That's two. <coughs> the autonomic system. So this is one ganglion system. This one's two ganglion. So it has a pre and a post. The pre would sit in the central nervous system. That's a given. We know that. The post would sit, remember we learned those Sympathetic ganglion, there you go. There's your post sympathetic ganglion that I'm going to use nerve firing versus using the fibula of the adrenal gland. So they both would fire different ways, but one would fire to this, one would fire to that. So there's your post and the glands are here. The bottom line is we want this product to come out or this. So when we're talking about this type of nervous system, not only does that have a pre and post that's going to be out you know, in the periphery or out in the body somewhere. Also, it's going to have, it can have two neurotransmitters. Depending on what system I'm firing. So it can have the acetylcholine or norepinephrine. Why is it called epinephrine? Instead of adrenaline. Because it is. All the adrenaline. Mm. Think of anatomy. What's the other name for a kidney? Nephron. nephron. And where's the adrenal gland sit? Above the nephron. So we call it epinephron. Epinephrine. That's how it gets its name. It's a hormone, yes. It's a honeymoon, yes. <laughs> okay? So, there you go. So, this shows you the big difference between a somatic nerve, which is going to fire much faster, then the autonomic system is on the top. The autonomic system is constantly working, constant, you know, in a constant rhythm that it works at. It can change itself if it has to. Also, and this is only going to use one system, acetylcholine. No matter what system fires on skeletal muscle, acetylcholine is the only product that's coming out of it. Okay, no effort is only going to hit tissues that are related to the autonomic system. 
This is what you're going to. This is what you take the pot now in physiology. How do I know which one is fire on? Beta one, beta two. Well, I'm going to fire on nicotinic fibers, which will turn on the parasympathetic system, or I'm going to fire on muscular fibers, which is going to turn on the sympathetic system, which are my two beta fibers. Okay, that's why they go on beta blockers to shut down the sympathetic system, so your heart rate don't keep pumping. Do we need to know degrees of myelination on the uh, no. outside? Don't worry about that. This is basic, the basic is the difference between them. <coughs> okay, so there is a difference. This is no control, this one you control. This one has one game and on, that has two games on. That's all you kind of <coughs> So let's go down further now and let's take apart the ergonomic system. So now we're going to break it down, the ergonomic system, into a parasympathetic and a sympathetic, right? So we have the sympathetic. Versus the parasympathetic. So right off the top of your head, this one here is fight, flight. And this one is rest, digest. So you're seeing that right off the top of your head. So this is kind of like your stress system. Stress. That's when you're stressed, you're using this. Anatomy uses this. When you're studying for anatomy, you're using this. <laughs> Why did not be using it? Alright? Where does it originate from? Well, this one originates thoracolumbar. And this one originates cranial sacral. Just by the picture, it's showing you that. So if you look at this picture, think about your cranial nerves. What one would this be? Ocular motor. No, not eye. Ocular motor, right? This would be what? Which one did salivary hands? Facial and glossopharyngeal, right? And this would be all vagus. Vegas does a lot. Everything down to here is Vegas. The ability to talk, Vegas. <coughs> the ability for food to move through your gut, Vegas. So Vegas is a really important parasympathetic nerve. Very important. The sympathetic originates from where? What? Lumbar? Thoraco lumbar. Spell that? Oh, I thought you said, I thought you were saying Loraco. I, I don't know. I can't see it. We're not in Texas. We're talking about Loraco, Texas. No. Get that wild right now. No riding the wrong nose. No, Thoraco, lumbar. So, where did you see the sympathetic ganglion in the thoracic region and down to the lumbar? Up here, they know the stellar ganglion. They, they send branches out. Who's ever heard of like sympathetic reflex dystrophy? Person gets it in the hand. And so true, so you get the red ring of blue signs in the hand, which can lead to great knots phenomenon. So, how do they get rid of it? They go in and they inject the cell again and destroy it. Can you get rid of that, really? Yeah, that's how they get rid of it. Isn't that kind of unnecessary, though? It's actually not very serious. Right. It's, a, it's only if the pain is excruciating. What creates sympathetic ref sympathetic reflex dystrophy is a severe chronic pain. You can have Raynaud's not related to that, but that in turn could, could create Raynaud's and some of it doesn't. So in the case of yours, you don't want to do it just thinking to avoid extreme temperature changes to the hands. So you don't stimulate. But Raynaud's phenomenon, due to that, they go in and inject the still gain more of the sympathetic response to the young experiment. And the person will lose a lot of their symptomatology. They have no choice, but they have. So they go in there, a strong saline solution that destroys the ganglion and the symptoms disappear. So thinking of this now, this is going to have, so when you think about fight flight, this has a broad effect on the body. This has a narrow effect, it's more targeted to specific organs. 
okay, target. So think about it. So let's go into what this system does to affect our bodies, okay? So the effects of the system. So we look at the effects. The eye only want to focalize the eye a little bit about this. Let's look at the pupils. Parasympathetic system is going to constrict the pupils. Think of opiates. Opiates are going to turn the system up. Sympathetic is going to dilate it. Think of somebody on a cocaine range. It was a dilate, you just did a little smash through the room, right? They like knock the door down and out of here. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. So there's two, two things in the drugs. Look at somebody, they're fixed and constricted. They're probably high on opium. Fixed and dilated and they're in a rage. You know, forget this person, they're not reaching them right now. They're high on coke. <coughs> it's restraining them. So you can do, you know, then so much glands, you don't really care about the gland you like to, but think of heart rate. Heart rate, what's it gonna do to the heart rate? Parasympathetic is gonna slow it down. Sympathetic is gonna increase it. What's it gonna do to blood pressure? Parasympathetic, slow it down. Sympathetic, increase it. Respiration, parasympathetic, slow it down. Sympathetic, increase it. See what a broad effect it's having on you? You just don't get a little bad, you get mad. Heart rate goes up, respiration goes up, blood pressure goes up. You're an output of decrease, you don't have to be peeing all over the place, okay? Yeah, to facilitate the adrenaline to the rest of the body. Right, that's what it's going to do. So now what we want to do too to our liver, we want to have to smash the liver to release glucose. Why? We need a lot of energy in the blood to go to our muscles, to power our muscles. So you're going to vasodilate it into the muscles because you want the muscles to be getting maximum oxygen levels hitting them so we can utilize the sugar problem. You're going to overstimulate the adrenal medulla to secrete out tons of adrenaline. You're not going to do that. The only thing you're turning on, well, there's two things you turn on with the, with the parasympathetic system, peristalsis. Gut motility turns on. So you can break down food and digest it. We're not going to do that with sympathetic. You're going to shut it down. Sympathetic shuts down the gut. Parasympathetic turns it on. And the only other organ that's going to turn it on? Oh, yeah. Penis. Well, female parts too. The clitoris is a little red and it'll cause it to, you know, cause erection and dilation here. But here it does the opposite. So when you're uptight and stressed, that ain't happening. You're going to be limp. I have a question. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, how, come, how come, like, when people are on opiates, they get, like, constipated, when people are on coke, they get diarrhea? Because why? It's, it, it hits new receptors that also slows down gut activity. Okay. Even though it's stimulating the power, it's also slowing down the smooth muscle activity. So that's how it knocks down your blood pressure, too. Nice. Okay? It's, it, even though it's, it's not a stimulant, it's a depressant. Where Coke is a stimulant. Mm. So he's drinking his pips? Yes. That's why. It has different receptors in the gut. Okay. It doesn't just target the way you think. All right? So that's the reason why. It's like someone dies, they crap in. It doesn't happen instantly. When you move the body, it just, mm. and everything shuts down. The fingers just open up, and that's it. It makes a big mess. But that's the thing. Someone's stressed. Now what we're going to go is take this one step further. We've, we've finished off the nervous system. So how does stress kill you? How does stress wound your body? So think of these things that are going on here, okay? And we're going to go into the last chapter, which we do at the end of the semester, but I want you just to see this stuff, okay? Because of what we've covered the two systems now. So I kind of want you to see by Stressing the living crap by yourself, which you love to do. How it wounds you. Now, under normal circumstances, the nervous system fires, stimulates, stimulates the, the pancreas, the pancreas, stimulates the adrenal vent to secrete adrenaline, because you're under normal stress. You're exercising, you're playing sports, or you're pissed off about something, but it's normal for the increase heart rate, blood pressure, and then convert glycogen to glucose. So you want to break it down, your body needs the energy. <coughs> 
you're either working out, you're exercising, or you, you're stressed. Your body needs sugar to make the brain function. So you will change the blood flow. You increase metabolic rate. This is short term. But you, be, you become this person that you stress out about everything. Everything stresses you. The world's going to end tomorrow. You're that type of person, okay? The world hates me. The world's going to end. I mean, here we go. So this system never shuts off. So now it's no longer becoming neurological, becoming hormonal. It's becoming a fake, false Cushing's disease. Because there is a true Cushing's disease, which is a tumor here, which constantly pushes out adrenaline in your body and damages the body. But there's also false Cushing's that you're doing to yourself. So you get this normal person, doesn't have to be heavy, tries to eat right, exercises, and now they become a hypertensive free diabetic, like it or not. Because they can't divert their stress. They're off the wall. Stress. Well, what's happening when you're breaking down the book, your mineral protocols, this is pretty much thinking of your, your, um, yeah, the effort. Well, now we start retaining sodium. When we retain sodium, we build up, we build up volume in our body. Volume build up increases blood pressure. So there you go. So now you go to your six month checkup. You know what? Your pressure is probably be like 120, 125, over 70. Now you're saying like 140, 145, over 90. Then you're going to put you on a mild diuretic. <coughs> Here we go. We start with the drugs. Your fasting blood sugar should be like 96, 99. Now you're like 108. You're pre diabetic. Let me give you something for that too. Which is another drug. So you're taking a healthy person and you're medicating them. And that's not the issue. The issue is that it's like, it's, you know, they need to go to counseling. They need something to change their lifestyle here more than what they're ingesting and how they're physically, you know, physical, but they're not, they are excited. Because they're constantly converting glucose for energy, increasing blood sugar. Eventually, you become immune suppressed. How? Because you become adrenal suppressed. So you can give yourself diabetes. Yes. And you can give yourself hypertension and give yourself other nasty diseases that can take you because you're suppressing your immune system by stress. So, what I think the number one killer in the United States is this. This. Prolonged stress. Prolonged stress. We're all under it today. More so than you were 50 years ago. In your grandparents' time and my parents' time. It's a different world to live in. A different world to survive in. Just find an answer to survive in. You know, when I first got out of school to become a doctor, a person who made 50000 a year back in the early 80s, late 70s, could live the same lifestyle as a millionaire, just on the owner's market, you could have one of each thing that they have. Today, you're making 100000 a year, you're poor. That's not a stress. Come out of college, we'll 250,000 student loans. If you go to a doctor now, I'm a lawyer, big shit, and I'll pay it back. You follow what I'm saying? That's not stress. So do you believe, you know, you do not believe that this is not causing different cancers in the pancreas and different cancers in the liver by constantly hitting it to keep secreting out more insulin? Constantly stimulating the islet cells that are not getting to shut down because you're so freaking stressed out. There is a relationship. And if you have the genetic genes for these things to happen, boom, you're going to spend it on a lot easier than just what you're ingesting. That's how stress can kill you. You can show it just through the endocrine system. And what will happen, you take this in this next picture here of a false Cushing's disease, that you know, this could be a normal female, now she looks like this in five years because she did this to herself. I'm not talking, this is Cushing's disease. This is what's but you could look like this in five years because you did this to yourself. Because with stress comes what? Muscle tension. Muscle tension, causing the, the eating habits are going to change. You might start drinking. Here on spring break every day, so to study it. <laughs> you 
Do you follow what I'm saying? So, this is due to a tumor sitting down in her. This real condition of cushions is a tumor sitting, an adenoma sitting inside the, the medullary part of her uh, adrenal gland. It would cause this because she's constantly kicking out the hormone ACTH. That's how you find it. You come to our urine body looking for that hormone. You see an increase in it, probably not <laughs> that. But also, ACTH would be increased in a person that's stressed out to no end, which would cause the same problems as cushions. Look at the difference in her. Look at the difference in Leah. She's not happy. What happened when you cheated on her? See what that happened? That no good bum? You cheated on her, messed her whole life up. Now, how about if we throw on top of this, if we throw on top of this problem of stress, because she's immune depressed, we put the Epstein Bob virus in there. It's tied up at 1600 all the time. Now she comes out with chronic fatigue on top of it. In terms of this person, definitely going to know we're fighting my house right now. You know that. That's a given. She goes on disability, you know. You know, then for that. Because there was nothing medically wrong with her for that to happen. Just by talking to someone that would have probably helped her. I mean, generalized anxiety is like a condition, so. No, it is. I'm not. I'm just saying. But did you? But as a primary care type person, someday, and you're just don't miss it. Fix it before it gets to that point, because you can. Just talking to the patient, counseling the patient. How many students I counsel in a damn year? It's unbelievable. It's just we got a counselor instead of a professor. They come in and talk to me, and they're all. I said, well, you know what? You're. You're like 50 yards from the finish line now. Why don't you go? You know, you can cross it. Just revamp yourself up to it. You don't have to shut things down and open up things up in your body. And that's emotional. Because you'll see, you'll go in and I'll show you the limbic system. And if you look at the other, of the autonomic system, bringing the limbic system into this, brings it in big time. So your emotion plays a big role on you. Do you sleep good if you stress? No. You don't sleep good at all. So is your body regenerating if you're not sleeping? If you don't sleep good, you cut years off your life. That's a known fact. The studies have not done to show that. You know, the rest of your body is not resting, your body is regenerating. So they have all these sleep studies on that. Showing them related to cardiac disease, related to other problems. Or the constant hypertension, could that not cause left-sided heart failure later in life? Yeah. I will mainly go to the left ventricle. Most common. That's true. So it's not only the lifestyle change doesn't just mean eating exercise. It's the whole person. I mean taking the emotion of the person too. And that gets lost in the medical model, the emotion. Because in society today, too, like, most people think that they're getting fixed by taking a pill. Right. Well, that's the deal. Take a pill. This is the United States. Take a pill for everyone. Who we blame? The pharmaceutical industry wants to stay in the country. There's a pill for Look at the TV. How many pill commercials do you see watching the show? At least it's five or six and a half hour. And we have to take a pill for this, take a pill for that. Seriously, even if something is thing of that, there's no pill, right? I'm trying to say there's a pill for every damn thing today. Where 40 years ago there wasn't. Lifestyle. Why don't we want, we want instant relief in the United States? I want to take a pill and keep doing what I'm doing. I don't want to stop and smell the roses. 